Um, please join me in welcoming our, our next keynote speaker, Cameron McNaught. Uh, he's responsible for the globalization of our portfolio here at Fujitsu and uh, specifically identifying, developing, and managing many of the cloud and strategic solutions that are coming out. So when you go over into the workshop, into the demonstration area, and you look at those different things coming out from R&D, and you think, how on earth or what is Fujitsu going to do to productize that? You can ask Cameron. Thank you. Cheers. Good afternoon, everyone. I guess, um, as Richard said, my role is really about taking what is the best of Fujitsu from technology, products, services, and indeed our partners' um, capability in bringing all those together and delivering them to our customers. So I'm at the point where we take that new technology and put it into our customers and embed it. So it's a little bit of a change of pace. I'll, I'll talk about what we're doing with some customers and how we're doing it and so forth as I go through this. So my portfolio in Fujitsu, I look, of one, look after one of the three global business units. Uh, and within that remit is cloud, mobility, big data, network and security, our industry businesses, retail, healthcare, automotive, and some of our broader businesses around SAP, Oracle, Microsoft, and Cisco, and our global technology office. So I'm quite lucky that I have a large base to draw on when we try and put these solutions and these kind of capabilities together. But I'm going to talk from a customer perspective, if you don't mind, this afternoon for the next 20 minutes or so around what we're seeing. And in 2013, there is no doubt from our customers, they saw a a real shift in what was happening in their business. It was no longer standard roadmaps, standard approaches. There was mass disruption and also opportunity to harness these new technologies. A lot of what you've heard are throughout the day, and as I'm sure you have over the last seven years of this event for those who have attended. But what we're seeing now is, is um, periodically taking these capabilities, whether it's mobility, cloud, or the emergence, of, let's say, of big data into enterprise and government and adopting those. And the real power of those, we kind of summarise down into three use cases. And the first one here is a new use. And what we've found is just one technology or trend in isolation hasn't created a transformational shift in business. Yes, you can bring in cloud. But if you bring in cloud, mobility, big data, internet of things, and bring those together, you are starting to see transformational shift inside enterprise and inside government. The first one is new use, and I guess I was thinking of this driving down here this afternoon, um, a use case of, of a new use. And I was at a theme park, I'm from Australia, um, I live here now in the Bay Area, but I'm from Australia and I was down there on Christmas holidays, and I went to a new water park, and it was quite interesting. Um, my family signed me up online, I got my season pass in the mail, and it was a waterproof wristband that was an RFID tag that was tagged to myself. Um, I was able to load cash or money into the, into the wristband, and when I arrived at the park, I was able to swipe in and go through the turnstiles with no interaction. I was able to swipe in and go on all the different rides. It was a water park. I was able to have my photo taken by roaming photographers and also on the rides. I was able to buy my lunch and drinks and buy a locker, all through this um, you know, mobile kind of attachment to me that knew who I am. Now, at the end of the day, as I was leaving the water park, it popped up and said, hey, Cameron, do you want to see your photos? And I was able to see the catalogue of the day of every ride I went on, every photo that was taken of me um, within, within that park. Better still, I was able to go home and download and print them because that was part of my seasonal pass. So every interaction didn't involve a human and was done through contactless um, experience for me. So to me, that is a new use. And we're starting to see that happen in so many industries with our customers. Whether it's retail, whether it's healthcare, we're starting to see those adoptions. And it wasn't just the technology of RFID, it was the integration of that to the complete park platform that they've done that. And it was the only way they operated. I had to tell you, for the, for the people who didn't buy the pass, it was something like a four hour wait to get a paper pass that they could use to get in. So it was quite interesting. Then if we look at consumption, this has been the transformational shift if anything happened over the last 12 months for our customers, is the, the ability to innovate in real time by drawing down consumption of technology. Predominantly, this is you know, talking about cloud. If you have an idea here this afternoon, by the time you get home, you've probably compiled enough resources that you can test and innovate your idea. And that has really changed the pace of our, our customers' businesses. And finally, we heard just earlier this afternoon our big data. 
There is no doubt we're on the edge of a, a very interesting stage with big data. I think we're catching the low-hanging fruit where we're putting in big data and we're analysing information that exists. But there's some side businesses that we we'll see starting to happen here. We're starting to see, I was with a bank only in December, who was saying, we want to make money out of our data. We have a mass of data, both customer and financial. How do we create an API that I can sell that information within the right privacy controls? And I thought the panel discussion was quite interesting. Once you start doing those matching, what is the ethical ownership of that information? When you create a match that then breaks a privacy rule, how is that? So we see some real challenges here, but we see just the beginning of the emergence. So we take all those trends, we kind of bring them down into those kind of models, new uses, new consumption, and new operations for business. And that's allowed our customers over the last four years as they started to adopt some of these te technologies, in particular cloud as I go into it, to move across this, you know, first, second, third wave type environment and we talk about, we talk about the mainframe area, we talk about client server. But what we see now happening in this kind of final wave and you know, term it cloud, term it information age, but we're starting to see organisations to be able to differentiate themselves. Within that second wave, we all ended up looking the same, client, server environment. We found it very hard to use technology to differentiate. Now in real time, we're seeing organisations, and I have to say in particular retail at the moment, differentiating themselves by being able to pull down real-time information or real-time services, add them into their mix, and see if that changes their business. Does it create a shift in sales? Does it create an efficiency in operation? And that's where we see the differentiation coming from when we talk to customers about adopting these technologies. So just on innovation for a minute of it, Fujitsu sees cloud as the platform for innovation. Because of its agility, because of its consumption models, it will fuel mobility, big data and social businesses. Because it is real time, it is consumption based and you can draw on it. And that's why we call it an innovation platform. But not just cloud in itself, and I'm going to talk about what we're doing and where we're investing in this whole area of it, cloud integration. And it's about taking not just Fujitsu cloud services, it's everybody's cloud services, whichever cloud service an enterprise or government wants to consume, and their traditional, and bringing them together. The power of integration is a shift we're seeing with these technologies with our customers now. And I'll come to that in, in more detail. And um, we heard about the Fujitsu Big Data Initiative. This is a Fujitsu Cloud Initiative. We announced it in April last year. Um, Fujitsu um, is a, let's say, not a well-known cloud player, but for us it's a 1.6, well it's actually now $1.8 billion business globally. We're the second fastest growing in absolute revenue behind Amazon for infrastructure as a service. So for us, it is a growing business. It's an area we invested in in the labs and technologies maybe six years ago. We've put our first platforms into the market um, four years ago, and now we have it in 18 centres, and it'll be something like 24 to 26 as we go through calendar 2014. So it is very much a rapidly evolving platform um, business for us. What differentiated us was we realised it needed to have a choice play in it. You needed to be able to give customers more choice than a single platform for a single solution or a single workload. And over the last um, four years, we've rolled out multiple technology platforms in an infrastructure sense around the world. And these were servicing the demands of security, geographic location, who had access to the data, and the speeds and feeds and the price points of those platforms. So Fujitsu today offers everything from an on-premise platform delivered anywhere in the world within three weeks, through to a platform in 18 centres um, around private hosted that is managed in country, data stays in country, and the staff stays in country. And if you look at the changes in the EU over the last six months, this has really resonated with our customers. And then to truly public platforms that service the broad bros horizontal type applications um, in our public sense. But we don't create all our own technology. Um, this was a recent acquisition, actually it was April last year where we acquired this company called Run My Process um, out of um, Paris in France. This was true innovation we saw in the market that we needed to have when we talk about cloud innovation. Out of the box it came with 1,800 predefined cloud or non-cloud connectors to create data and process integration. So if you were drawing down on the EU currency service or you were connecting to Netflix or you are doing Dropbox or you're talking back to your SAP ERP system, this had a connector for it. 
In a drag and drop GUIs um, page, you can create business process and data interchanges from any cloud or non-cloud service. I think the team now are up to about 2,400 connector types for cloud services out there. If you can think of a cloud service as a connector, then in under a couple of minutes, you can create a data interchange business process workflow in a you know, web-based GUI interface. So we needed this to talk about the story that I'm going to go to. But just to share with you a, a small piece around how our customers have been adopting cloud. So we have this technology, we have these platforms, we have the success um, with, with our customers. What is the process they go through? And this is very non-technical. This is very much around the business and what we're talking to them about and where it seems to resonate. Every business, organisation or entity has some forms of what we call triggers whether it's to reduce cost, improve efficiency, could be um, mergers and acquisitions, it could be faster time to market, something at a strategic level inside that organisation is driving what we call a trigger. It could be something simple as a hardware refresh or a software renewal. So what we do is we work with our customers to understand what are those triggers in your business? How will you adopt these new technologies? Or what are these new technologies that will support those triggers? Once we work that out with the customer, we sit in there and say, well, what are those workloads? Is it your ERP backend? Is it your order process? Is it your CRM environment? What are those workloads that we can group together and then walk through a process of do we modernize them? Do we transform them to a cloud delivery model, which is where we're trying to take them? Or do we just go and draw down a brand new service that is delivered from the cloud today? So we work through what are those workloads. Now this is where we got to this point of choice around delivery. So we say to our customer, okay, you want to move your core ERP system, just like we did with Singapore Post um, uh, for their customer-based SAP system. And they said, we want to move it to a cloud platform. It's okay to go outside of our firewall, but it needs to stay in country. It needs to be in a dual data center cloud platform in country because of the privacy of the information that is running on SingPost's platform. So we were able to determine the platform, and that was Fujitsu's private hosted platform, which is in country, multi tenanted Then the customer said, then we say to the customer, how do you want your ERP delivered back to you? Do you want to deliver it as an infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or as a software as a service? And that really defines how much control they're willing to give up in their technology stack or their application stack. And so for this case, they, were, they wanted the value, agility, and price point of infrastructure as a service, but wanted SAP managed and run traditionally. And so that's what we call the delivery model. So if you take that, that creates cloud choice the choice of how you want to consume cloud, where you want to deliver it from, and the type of model, infrastructure platform or software. So over the last four years we've been doing this, and as you said, 3,600 enterprise or production-based customers running their workloads on these platforms, we kind of hit a roadblock. We realized even though we were giving all this choice and all this technology Fujitsu had to bring to our customers, we still couldn't meet the requirements. With four platforms in 18 data centers around the world, with everything from infrastructure to platform to software as a service, our customers still wanted more. Our customers still needed and found a workload placement for Amazon or for Salesforce or for some of our competitors in the market. So what we had to look at was how can we provide this independent integration capability that allows a customer to take any cloud or a non-cloud service, aggregate them together, and in November last year we announced Fujitsu Cloud Integration Platform. And so this is taking a lot of what is Fujitsu IP technology that we've developed over the last five to six years in our orchestration capability, in our, our product stacks, in our marketplace capabilities. We're delivering cloud SaaS-based services both in Japan um, and Germany and some broader markets. And how do we now integrate all those together? Um, and to do this, we had to then acquire some technology and run my process was one of those. And we had to partner in some areas to do that. Uh, and our feedback, we are now in, in what we call our customer pilot phase, which is a quarter before general availability, where we run some of our leading customers who are willing to sign up for this program to, to take it on. So let me talk a little bit about why. What we found with this rapid adoption of these new technologies, you know, such as cloud, somewhat of the ownership disappeared for enterprise. And this was important at a board level. Who owns the information? Who has control of that information? And where is it residing? 
And secondly, who was managing the procurement cycles? Were we now overspending in IT to get all this agility, to get all this um, speed to market, but were we duplicating effort? And so the CIO and the board had a challenge here, but the one thing they don't want to do is slow down adoption, remove innovation out of their business. So what we announced, as I said, was the cloud integration platform. It's a platform in the sense that it's a 1A technology platform that we are going to provide from, from the cloud or on premise, depending on the profile of the customer, that allows them to aggregate all these different types of services together. They may have an Amazon web service for their test and development or for, their, for a certain process in the business. They will certainly have a back-end ERP system that's running on premise. And they'll continue to evolve their workloads into different areas. So this capability and it came out with six initial modules to be able to aggregate together on-premise workloads, Fujitsu cloud workloads, and other cloud workloads as this market continues to evolve and diversify in the variety of services you can get from the cloud. The first one was resource provisioning and reporting. And this isn't just an aggregation. I'm going to talk through an example in a minute, if you don't mind, around where we saw the power of it. But the ability to be able to priv provision an infrastructure platform or SaaS service, regardless of vendor, through an aggregator portal to your enterprise users. Um, was what we meant by that. Process and data integration, I think I talked about around the run my process capability. The minute you provision a new cloud service, it is auto integrated in. So if you provision a new SaaS service for a new CRM user, that is integrated back in, for example, if it was designed for your HR system or into your mail system. So pre-integration at the time of provisioning. The third one was data management. This seems to resonate the most with customers. They are now putting their data out into multiple providers and into multiple locations. There is one thing around protecting it, and I heard about um, you know, some, some areas of cryptography today and securing data, and that's extremely important, but who holds a copy of that information? Should that provider go out of business, change the structure of the data, change the commercial rules, and you want your information back? Customers are telling us, even though we're happy with the data to be out there, we want a copy. And we want a copy on premise or stored with an independent provider. So at any time, we can always recover systems. We can never recover information if we don't own it. So data management was an important one there. So we can go out and, and replay a complete transaction that's happening on salesforce.com and then port it across to another CRM provider by doing that interchange. And that's the capability there. System process and monitoring. Um, the ability to have a single dashboard across your on-premise and cloud-based services regardless of provider. And that was important as we learned how do we could inject our capability into third-party cloud providers to be able to show that type of information. Service management, obviously a single wrapper to do that. And then finally, identity and access management. This was probably the last piece that we had to solve. How can we have a single identity that is your enterprise identity on store on premise, how can we use it to interact with every single ICT service that you're using, whether it's from a third party cloud provider, Fujitsu, or your traditional on premise workloads? So, to be able to pass around the identity to any one of those workloads. Um, and so, we aggregated that together. It was about integrating different services, about automating them, and about managing them together. So, that's the cloud integration platform. And I guess I think this slide, there's a couple of screenshots here, it's a little hard to see, but let me talk through an example, a simple infrastructure as a service provisioning. Most days today, our customers have somewhere between five and seven cloud providers, if you're an enterprise or government customer. Um, a lot of our customers are telling us that will grow to 30 to 50 different cloud services as each application workload is assessed and decide that it can be consumed from a consumption-based model such as cloud. So here's an example. I'm an ICT provider, so I'm a CIO, and I have a need to provide infrastructure as a service to a department. Now, the department can go and procure that themselves, but the difference here is they procure it through a single management portal. At the point of provisioning, the data, um, the data protection um, environment is injected in, the monitoring environment is injected in, and the identity is provided across to the, the third party provider. So that infrastructure as a service is now managed, and it doesn't matter if you have seven or 10 different infrastructure as a service providers, they are all managed the same way. The data is protected the same way, monitored the same way, and managed the same way. 
And so it gives a customer the confidence that they can still go out and use any cloud provider that makes sense for that business unit, but it is managed and aggregated in a simple um, and convenient way that kind of provides the governance and mitigates the risk for the, for the business, but continues to provide agility and innovation. And we can do that in an infrastructure and a platform and a software as a service level. And as I said, we'll progressively roll that out. So just to kind of summarize that, what it gives our customers is the access to any new technology, but a framework to aggregate those together and present them back to the business in an agile, repeatable and governed kind of way. Some would say it's trying to slow down and control and you know, bring in a, a layer of governance. It's not. It's about protecting the business and accelerating adoption because these are predefined. So um, we see it as really, you know, we use this term single pane of glass, probably overused, but allows um, different business units to bring their own clouds from whatever provider into a seamless way. Um, so as I said, it's you know, available from 1st of April as GA um, globally from Fujitsu, and we really think it's going to change the rapid adoption of cloud-based services, mobility services, and in the future, big data services as they're aggregated into an easy-to-use platform for that. So with that, I just wanted to summarise to say, um, as we have said, we see cloud as the platform for innovation. Because of its agility, because of its broad reaching ability to integrate different capabilities and services, and to allow real time um, access to technology from a, a platform, which is an aggregation of multiple platforms into the business. We certainly see new uses for technology. If I go back to what I started with, what our customers are saying is, how do we improve the user experience? And I might finish with a couple of different trends we're starting to see over the last 12 months. The adoption of self-service in enterprise and in government and even in small to medium business is rapidly taking hold. If we take one industry, um, for example, um, retail. Over the last five years, retail really took um, self-service to the next level and we went online with online shopping over the last five to 10 years. And then if you look across all different industries, there's this element of self-service creeping in. You know, I talked about the theme park experience to me, that was complete self-service. The only time I had to interact with anyone was when the food was placed at cost. I still don't know why they didn't automate that process. But, you know, the ability to have complete self-service in those new modes. And then the point around big data, as I said, I think we're starting to see the low-hanging fruit adoption. You know, you might have a retailer that is looking at traffic, work um, flows inside their organisation, but how does that really improve um, sales for, for a retailer? And I'll have to say, one of the challenges we're starting to see with big data, not just in Fujitsu, but in the industry, is where will the skill come from? There is one thing to build the platform, there is one thing to put sensors out there, aggregate public and private information into a big data set, but then who will write the algorithms, the patterns that really will find that transformational shift in information? And that skill isn't typically in the mainstream provider, ICT providers today. We still think it's in the research centres, we still think it's in, in the educational institutions, and how is that more rapidly drawn out? Because that is where we'll see the big shift in big data. And the last one, the consumption model, and where I focused on today was cloud. That consumption model is now mainstream. I think even 12 or 18 months ago, we were saying how real is cloud. It's certainly real in startups. It's certainly real in, in many parts of business. But what we've certainly seen in the last 12 months with our Fujitsu customer base is the adoption of it for production workloads. If I look across the portfolio of Fujitsu in cloud, 68% of the workloads are core business systems running on our cloud platforms, as opposed to websites, as opposed to test and dev, it is core platforms running on that. So it really has been a shift for our business across those. Um, so with that, I think I was asked if you have any questions, happy to take any questions um, on that. But again, thank you for your time, really do appreciate it, thank you. I think I can hear. Let's come. Sorry. 
Thank you very much. Great talk. Um, question. So uh, on uh, one of your slides, you mentioned 2015 and beyond is uh, the disaggregation of, uh, of the cloud, or I don't remember what exactly the heading was, but um, we would appreciate if you could elaborate on that, what you mean by disaggregation. Let's find that slide. <laughs> No, so I guess you start with, um, it was custom computing and then um, that was the first kind of phase. Oh, it was the, the three pillars? The three pillars, yeah. yes. So what we're saying, it seems to happen a lot quicker now than from when we kind of did that research, but not disaggregation of cloud, but we're still seeing a huge fragmentation of cloud inside enterprise. Um, there is, a, you know, Fujitsu is a strong cloud provider and we're proud of that kind of record, but there is no one cloud provider that can service a whole, in, a whole business at all. And so we continue to see the fragmentation of that and we, I don't think we'll see a consolidation of that. I think if we look at some of the recent trends in security or some of the issues in security, um, where we started to see maybe three years ago we're going to have mega, mega cloud data centers that were going to run everything and certain providers were putting them up to run any kind of workload. Um, you know, the EU is taking a very strong stance around it must be in country not even just in the EU. So we're going to put platforms in, in um, France, in Italy, in Netherlands, around that. And so that disaggregation, I guess, is happening with cloud, where these big mega plays will happen for some workloads, but as information is now trying to be contained closer to, let's call it home, that we're starting to see that happen. And that seems to be accelerating rather than decelerating like we thought maybe three years ago. Um, but more so cloud, you know, if I'm a CIO and if I'm a purchaser, ideally if I was a startup, but in an enterprise, I would find the best platform for the workload or the best workload platform stack. As long as you can aggregate them together, integrate them and manage them as one and take that complexity out, that's when, you know, you, that's where we see the aggregation rather than the provider and the platform today. Okay. Any other questions? I don't mind, I've got a seven o'clock flight to Germany. <laughs> Hi. Yes. You, you mentioned something earlier about uh, um, uh, the skill sets for integrating cloud or integrating IT, ICT services are, are not necessarily there, but they're buried inside of R&D and maybe inside of other parts of the organizations. Do you see a change in the way that uh, ICT organizations go to market uh, Possibly it's where you take the R&D resources, bring them out in front of the customers, and you take the product organizations that normally were the front line selling and bring them into more of a platform supporting that. Do you see a transformation either in that direction or another way in how we go to market? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll give you a little bit of insight. So I was mainly talking more about big data and that kind of un uh, how, how you can write the patterns and algorithms for big data. That's a very specialised skill set that I still think is limited. But it sits in our research departments today and that skill is there. Um, so in Fujitsu, I have a policy in my group that we have a 30% rotation from what my group does to back of house to front of house and make sure it's continue evolving. Otherwise, it becomes quite, quite stale, if you want to call it that. So we have to bring more of our back office people, as much as they don't like it some days, um, forward to the customers. And I think that's critically important that we have more of our people who are deep in the technology, deep in the understanding of what really is big data and how can it be analysed and understood they have to come forward, so I agree. So we're working on a, a, a policy where take internal out and then do more partnerships with external research houses, external institutions where we can bring knowledge in as well and have a cycle through there where it's mutually beneficial from a business side back to a institutional side and so forth. So we're trying to do that inside out and outside in to try and enhance that, what we perceive will be a gap in the next 12 to 24 months. Okay, well thank you for your time, uh, really do appreciate it and enjoy the rest of the evening, thank you.